Hey, hi, welcome to a cozier than usual Friday. Right off the bat, let me just say thank you so much for the response so far to my video regarding and exploring the current state of historical romance. I have been very humbled by the response to that video and I'm glad that it's resonating with so many. It's making me feel a little less alone and I'm hopeful that it is making you feel a little less alone as well. So if you are here from that video, if you have been with the channel for a while. Either way, so grateful to have you here. And I'm excited to dive into a book with you today because believe it or not, it is directly relevant to the video regarding historical romance in a couple of different ways, not just because it is about a historical romance, which you surely saw from the thumbnail. But before we dive all the way in, hi, my name is Melody. We talk about books and book adjacent things on this channel. If you are not yet subscribed, I would love for you to subscribe and hang out with us more but I'm not gonna force you to do anything. But it's always an option, I'm just saying, as is liking the video and or sharing any of your thoughts through a comment, which are all very much appreciated, but above all, your presence is appreciated. So what does the debut historical romance, The Lady He Lost by Faye Delacour, have to do with our recent discussion beyond the fact that it was a historical romance debut in 2024? Well, if you watched that video, and if you have not, you should should, and you're seeing a little bit more frantic energy tonight than you saw from that video, but you may remember that I promised to try to keep a better grasp on intimate carriage scenes in historical romance, but I don't think I anticipated how quickly I would be reporting back about potential carriage shenanigans because The Lady He Lost by Faye Delacour, which is of course the book we are talking about today, does indeed have some potential carriage shenanigans, but we have a lot of ground to cover before we get to said carriage shenanigans. So how do we get there? I'm so glad you asked because the setup of this book is ripe for discussing as if it was the juiciest bit of gossip because we have our romantic leads, Eli and Jane, who grew up around each other and were friends. But this friendship was complicated by the fact that Eli was caught in a compromising position in the gardens with Jane's cousin, but not just a cousin, a cousin that is a rival of sorts for Jane. Jane and her younger brother Brother Edmund had been living with Cecily and her uncle after the death of their parents, and a lot of the closeness between Jane and Eli in their younger years revolved around the fact that Eli was helping tutor Jane, who could then tutor Edmund. But back to this compromising position. So Jane and Cecily have always been compared in terms of their looks. There's always been that closeness and age between them, and so Jane has often found herself measured against her cousin and found wanting to the point where they are described as having very similar features and faces, but Jane is often insecure in how she comes out in this comparison to the point of this quote, and while both women had wide cheekbones and a heart-shaped face, only Cecily's might have launched a thousand ships. Jane might manage a tugboat on a good day. Now keep in mind the tone of that. We will come back to the tone. I'm trying very hard not to say circle back after I said it like 5,000 times the other day. But you get the gist. Jane's essentially best friend and crush is discovered in a compromising position in the garden with her rival on whatever level Cecily. And not only that, but they are discovered by Cecily's father and an engagement is promised. However, that is not where the book starts. No, indeed the book starts with Eli not being dead because after this proposal he joins or has been in the Navy and goes off on an assignment and his ship sinks and he is believed dead for two years but like the very beginning of the book says okay maybe not the very beginning it's not the first line but it's at the beginning of the book it says at that moment, Eli himself walked into the room looking nothing like a man long drowned. He was breathing, his flesh was a healthy tan, and he wasn't even wet. And I think that that is a wonderful illustration in combination with the quote I read earlier of a lot of the humor that infused this book. And I wasn't expecting that because we have this setup 
of this basically long lost love, this man that Jane has believed is lost at sea, was engaged to essentially her rival but was her childhood friend and crush. There is a betrayal there on whatever level and amidst Jane now rebuilding her life, attempting to start a women's gambling club with her best friend to secure her own future, Eli comes waltzing back into the picture, except now Jane's cousin Cecily is married with a child, which is fine because Eli doesn't seem particularly concerned or as interested in her as he is in Jane, who is not as quick to forgive as Eli may have hoped and dreamed in captivity. And so there's this perfect opportunity for this combination of humor that we see come out in the writing and the tone of the book, but also the angst and pining that exist within this setup, which we will dig into a little bit more for sure. But going back to the humor, it was absolutely a delightful surprise. Additionally, these characters, while landowners, for the most part, they are not dukes or earls or viscounts in the traditional sense of historical romance more generally. And so I really hesitate. I don't really like comparing historical romance to Jane Austen because it often feels reductive and there is a lot of expectation that goes into that. But at the same time, some of the kind of explorations and the classes we were exploring in this novel did feel very reminiscent. The whole thing with Cecily is now she has a titled husband and so now she is a Lady Cecily and how big of a deal that is. And just some of the characterizations of these people, including in particular Jane's uncle, who was an absolute delight because he is so focused on Jane and Jane finding a suitor when it is the last thing on her mind and she's actively working against that aim for most of the book until of course Eli comes back into the picture. But even then, she's really working against the aim. But Bertie has this charm to him even when he is the chaperone that forces some hands as he is Cecily's father and forced that engagement. He also has a subplot romance that is kind of in the background for most of the book but is very charming and I love the relationship that he has with Jane because even when Jane doesn't necessarily agree with him or she thinks he's being a little overbearing in whatever way, she so clearly loves him and there's that kind of quirkiness inherent to him and some of the dynamics between people within the book did kind of remind me of some of that character study in combination. And some of the interactions between the characters in the book did remind me of that as well. And so the humor took me off guard because I went in, let's be real, because there was the promise of a woman wanting to start a gaming hell. And I love a gaming hell as a setting. Now we are in the early, early stages here. I have a sneaky suspicion that we're going to get to see it develop more over the course of this series. And don't worry, I already have the second one pre-ordered, but we mostly see it taking place within the home of Jane's best friend within this book. And there is a real financial reality tied to this. And Jane is willing to gamble and use this as a way to kind of secure her future because she is interested in the probability and the mathematics of it. We meet her teaching a new dealer in the club how to handle the cards. And so she's very pragmatic and practical, sometimes to a fault, especially once Eli enters the picture, because there are obviously hurt feelings here. And Eli, whose full name is Elazer Williams, which I love because it's an older kind of outdated name that we then have the more modernized version of throughout the story. But I think it's a nice kind of balance and touch. And it makes Eli as a hero a little more endearing in some ways. But in that he's also a little misguided because he expects to kind of waltz in and pick right back up with Jane where they left off. He is anxious to see his friend. He hasn't really fully unpacked. I don't think his feelings for her at the beginning, even as it's alluded to the fact that in captivity or while he was gone, which is a whole mystery in and of itself, that he did talk about Jane. And the mystery of where he was, was he captured by pirates? Is he going to be court-martialed? Kind of threads throughout, especially as Jane is very suspicious about the fact that he won't say anything about his time in captivity, which makes sense, especially if he really had been in captivity because 
there is some trauma there that is alluded to every once in a while in a way that made me think it's been a long time since I read Mary Ballow's Survivor series, but it did make me kind of want to circle back to that series because I really enjoyed how that grappled with the realities of coming back from war and what these men would have been grappling with. But Eli is clearly hiding something. Jane thinks he's hiding something. She plants the seed inadvertently that he may be hiding something that leads to some consequences down the line that I don't know fully play out emotionally in terms of really facing that between Eli and Jane in particular. And Eli and Jane and the fallout of a lot of these emotions is really interesting. So we end up getting them closer together because of course Jane wants nothing to do with him. But one, he's invited into this gaming association because he will draw more ladies because he is the main character of the moment. Everyone wants to know his story. Everyone wants to meet him. And so he's bringing in business. And then they end up going to Ascot together. So Jane, her brother, her cousin, her uncle, her cousin's husband and son who are not as present, the son more than the husband, as well as then Eli's family end up going and staying with a friend of Bertie, Jane's uncle. Maybe more than friends. Keep that in mind, though we only get allusions to said friendship. But this puts them in close proximity. In some ways, would it count as a house party because they are away from home, in tighter quarters, there's a whole scene of them playing parlor games? Yes, probably technically. However, for me, I would argue, and again, this is just my taste and how I have come up as a reader, I would almost argue that they are too close for it to be a house party because there is this constraint of how on top of it each other everyone is. Eli is rooming with Edmund, Jane's brother. Jane is rooming with Eli's sister. And so there is a lot of maneuvering of both of these characters in this proximity because they are always around other people. So this is obviously the opportunity to push these two together. But what does that look like logistically? Well, in at least one case, after they have warmed up to each other, or more accurately, I should say, after Jane has warmed back up to Eli, that leads to them sneaking away from a ball, a party, a dance, into a carriage together, back to the house. Enter said carriage shenanigans, which had a same kind of like frenzy and early discovery between two long-standing characters as we saw in Bridgerton season three. And even as the relationship between these two characters develops as they're drawn to each other, even as this history is still lurking in the past. And it's interesting because I think it establishes that emotional weight really well, especially at the beginning of the book. And I think that the humor that exists in the book is a really nice balance with it. It doesn't undercut it in any way. However, as the book nears that climax where we really have the opportunity for a lot of pining, a lot of angst, a lot of kind of emotional turmoil. We love a little emotional turmoil every once in a while, especially as these two have kind of had these secrets and these things unsaid lurking in the background. Jane feeling she was passed over for her cousin and then having to grieve Eli in private and reckoning with what this means and her world being kind of upset once again and whether she can even let herself open up to him. And even if a connection does form between the two of them? Will she only ever be seen as second place to her cousin in the eyes of society? Would marrying him mean giving up all of her dreams? Meanwhile, Eli has been keeping some secrets about the realities of that match with Cecily, as well as then facing the fact that Jane's suspicion and Jane's kind of snarky, kind of biting words, though society bite, led to some suspicion against him that could potentially cost him his career. And so there are larger repercussions to some of the words she's saying and her recognizing what the weight of those words are. And so all of that is going on and laid out. And I like the setup of it, but I do feel at a certain point, especially in the second half of the book, I feel like we pull back from it a little bit and we don't fully explore all of the emotional messiness, to use a term I really haven't used in a second, but it feels like it could have pushed. And to be clear, I enjoyed what we got, but if I were going to heighten it just even a little, I think we really would have pushed a little bit more 
into that emotional turmoil and really let those characters feel those feelings. It's almost like an acting beat where you're pulling back just a little bit and you really just need to push through it to really get to the full height of it. At the same time, I do like some of the heights we did get to. For instance, there is a moment in particular between Jane and her brother that I thought was just handled so, so well. And it was kind of a moment of realization for Jane about the world. And it didn't really feel fully resolved emotionally. I do think that that will circle back in later books potentially. I guess we'll see. But I thought that that was done really well. And I do like the sweetness between Eli and Jane that develops over the course of the book and the fact that both of them are feeling these feelings, which we know because this is written in my beloved historical third person point of view, third person dual point of view. But one thing I really appreciated about Eli too was his experience level and the exploration of his experience level in relation to the intimacy in this book in that he is very interested and focused on making Jane feel good but it becomes evident in the book that he may not be as experienced as Jane believes and as many would go in expecting a romance hero maybe to be. And I like that it kind of engages with the challenges of the patriarchy for everyone in those moments and the expectations that are had by men and women in relation to intimacy and how people are viewed for their experience or lack thereof by both sides. And I just really enjoyed having a hero that was a little more enthusiastic in certain moments and maybe his experience level was a little different than many. And I thought it was charming and I enjoyed the energy in some of those more intimate scenes as well because of it. It felt a little more playful in parts. It of course revealed more about some of these characters, more inner feelings as these scenes always do. And of course, it was spicy, but in a charming way. I don't know how to fully explain it, but I enjoyed the charm of it. And so overall, I think I would say about this one, I did enjoy the charm of it. I thought that the humor that it brought to the table was a delightful surprise. I thought that it set up really great emotional and character and plot beats. I don't know that it fully realized all of them, but I'm saying that with a heavy caveat because while it is a slight critique, it didn't diminish my enjoyment of the book by any means, especially for a debut. I was really charmed by this. I don't often immediately go and pre-order a book that's next in a romance series, but this one I did. And honestly, I probably needed to because while I read it finally by buying it on my Kobo, I have had this book checked out from the library at other points in the year and just hadn't gotten around to it. This book also made me care about its side character. So our next book is going to be about Jane's best friend, Della, who I'm very excited, but we haven't gotten the third, if there is a third book announced yet. I have hopes that Eli's sister, Hannah, will get a book. And I, I do think those are warranted because there's a whole scene which is also a reflection on Eli's character in which Hannah overhears some unkind words from some gentlemen at the Ascot and Eli comforts her and then also ends up confronting one of the gentlemen who also has a connection with Jane. So there's some dual narrative duty being played there while also revealing some more about Eli. There's a lot of good plotting at play there. So even when I say some things like maybe the actual reveal of Eli's story felt a little anticlimactic and some of the emotional beats could have pushed a little further, I think that those are really small, just kind of polishing critiques, especially, like I said, for a debut. And so I want Della's book and I want Hannah's book and I'm sure we'll meet others. It is interesting because usually I have a pretty good idea of who the couples in subsequent books are gonna be. And this go around, I don't have a firm grasp on the pairings. So I will be very interested to see how these couples continue to pair up and play out in the subsequent books. But in the meantime, I would highly encourage you to pick up this book. I think it's a lot of fun. You will get subsequent gems such as, really, what were gardens even for except to compromise young ladies at house parties? Everyone knew that. Or, you have to be willing to elbow a few guests out of the way, Eli said. It's how they make sure the punch goes to those who need it most. So if you like Bridgerton for Quinn's quippiness and the sharpness of her dialogue, I think that this would definitely be up your alley. So if you have not read this, 
get on it. If you have read this, I would love to hear your thoughts. But as always, thank you so much for hanging out and being interested in mine. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Read something good. And yeah, bye.